We'll, we'll just dive in. We'll dive in. All right, guys, Margie's not here to announce me, so I'll announce myself. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Michael Crowley. I teach the marketing course here, and whoever scheduled this, putting me after Terrence was brilliant. Um, you know, Terrence talked a lot about the data behind some of the marketing decisions and certainly the audience development strategies at his organization, so we're gonna get in the weeds here a bit. Um, yeah, and um, I'm gonna just roll up those sleeves, folks. Uh, I wanna leave you with five tactics and tools to develop new audiences and use digital media to engage current constituents. Um, so for those of you who work in the marketing field, I hope that these are things you can take back to your organizations. For those of you that manage marketers, um, I hope these are things you can go impress them with and make sure that they're doing at your organizations. Um, but before I get into this, I need everyone to take out their phones for me. We're gonna do something really quickly. So take out your phones and put them on your laps. Just put them on your laps. So let's pretend this was a typo. And instead of break, they meant to write Barack. And he has showed up. And our <laughs> former president has graced us with his presence. He is magically standing here at this capture podium. And he has told you that you can videotape his speech. So on the count of three, I want everyone to take your phones and show me how you would film our former president. Ready? One, two, three, go. OK, everyone look around. There's no wrong answer, but I want everyone to take a look at how people are holding their phones. Right? So we have a, a lot, some people holding it this way, some people holding it this way. Great. Experiment over, thank you. Phones down, <laughs> and next slide. Thank you. So the first thing I wanna talk about is vertical video, okay? And the statistic here, 94% of the time, we're holding our phones like this, right? So for those of you that, that, that went this way, it's not wrong. You can absolutely film a video that way. Ramona did that. She did. <laughs> it's okay, she's here to learn, she's here to learn. Um, but again, the, the vast majority of content these days is captured like this, okay? And as arts organizations, historically, when we thought, think about video content, we think horizontally, right? If you're an organization that has the resources to film a TV commercial or even a YouTube video, right? YouTube is in a horizontal format. So with the rise of social media platforms like Snapchat and Instagram, which we're gonna talk about a bit today, uh, we need to start thinking vertically. And this is a challenge of the arts, right? Because when we think about the performing arts, it's a proscenium stage, right? The, uh, half of the, the pieces of visual art in our museums are horizontal. So how do we think about this when we, when we go to actually capture content? Um, in my experience in-house as a director of marketing at a theater company, when we had you know, our press day, you go to shoot the photos of the actors, you get the video of the commercial, and then if you have five minutes, you get the intern to bring out their phone and do the little thing sideways, right? Um, in the last year, I've seen more and more organizations flipping that and reversing it, and starting with the vertical video. Because what we're gonna talk about in a minute, and, and those of you who have taken the marketing class, putting this content into the world is free, right? So you're capturing content and, and pushing it out to the followers of your pages in a way that doesn't cost you any money. Um, so, you know, and again, we, we're on these phones all day long. We're swiping through content, swiping through content. Be thumb stopping, right? Your organization's content has to capture our attention and do it within the first five seconds. So if I'm filming um, you know, a, a dance company and I, and I want to put out a, a vertical video, I have to make sure that in that first five seconds, there's something really exciting happening, right? Is it a leap? Is it a beautiful dancer's face? Whatever it is, we need to capture attention. Next slide. So um, I want to talk a little bit about Instagram. So I mentioned Snapchat and Instagram are the major sort of drivers of the vertical video revolution. Um, up until now, to, to serve a video on Instagram, you only had up to one minute. So for those of you who are Instagram users, you, you might notice when a, when a theater company has an opening night, uh, they'll serve you like 10 little minute videos in a row and you have to kind of click through to watch the video. As of the end of last month, they've launched a new product called Instagram TV, which now allows us to post videos up to an hour long, okay? And their goal here is really to play in the streaming space. So to sort of combat the Netflixization of the world um, and, and to really play in that space. But what this does for arts marketers, it allows us to share <coughs> long form content. So think about that. Sharing act one of a play. You know, what can you do to open up the doors, quite literally, in the digital space to new audiences? Um, I don't think many organizations have taken advantage of this yet because it's brand new technology. So I encourage you all to think about what long form content can we share with our users that helps re-engage them or potentially gets new audiences in the door. And these are just a few examples. Um, Williamstown Theater Festival in the Berkshires in Massachusetts 
partnered with Playbill and did a series of, you know, this is a two and a half minute video, but really taking you behind the scenes of the rehearsal process of a new musical. Um, this is from the uh, Instagram feed of Benjamin Millipede, who's one of my favorite choreographers. And again, just sharing rehearsal footage of one of his dancers. Um, and this, this is just a dude playing piano in his, his living room, right? <laughs> but think of the possibilities that are unleashed for individual artists, right? Individual performing artists in capturing content that is longer than one minute and sharing it to their followers. So the next sort of groundbreaking piece of new technology I want to talk about is customer match. And for those of you who have taken the marketing class, you know we, we love our Google week and we talk a lot about how Google has really um, taken all of our data and used it to sell us a lot of crap. <laughs> and as arts marketers, we need to leverage this technology to help get new audiences in the door. So customer, ma customer match basically allows you to take uh, a CRM list, right? So you know, Terrence mentioned customer relationship management. And we look at how, how the box office talks to development, talks to you know, all the different pieces of your organization. We can now take those lists of email addresses, physical mailing addresses, and phone numbers and upload them and talk to people across different platforms. And what this allows us to do is also create lookalike models. So if, if Chase and Ramona are subscribers on my list and I upload their, their emails, Google can say, hmm, they watch a lot of this type of TV. And so does, so does Sarah. So let's serve her an ad for this theater company. So it allows us to really focus on people who look like the people who are already coming to our organizations. And because Google owns YouTube, you can do the same thing in the video space, right? So if I have Sarah's email address and I know that she's on my email list, I can now hit her with a video about a, a product or offering. What this also allows us to do is play in the Gmail space. So how many of you are Gmail users here? Do you ever see those ads in the top that look like an email and you're like, who, what this is, it kind of fakes you out with an email? That's, that's this technology. It allows us to upload lists and serve ads to those people without actually emailing them. And the same with the lookalike. We can, we can serve emails to folks who, who look and, and sort of consume media in the same way that our current audiences do. And then lastly, as I said, YouTube um, allows us to target all sorts of folks, right? So as we start pouring out more content and, and developing um, you know, more videos on behalf of organizations, we can really broaden the tenant who we're talking to, right? It's not just about the people who are coming, it's about people, and we talked about the broaden, deep, and diversify. This is really about broadening, right? How do we find more people like those already coming? So, Facebook dark post. This sounds like the dark web, right? This sounds scary. I, I, Rochelle hopefully can attest after she learns about this. It's legal, I promise. Um, in the marketing course, we talk about something called the 70-30 rule. And that rule is that arts organizations, in my opinion, should spend about 70% of the time on, on social media uh, sharing content, having conversations with their constituents, but also spend about 30% of the time you know, promoting your programs, selling tickets. Um, with this new technology, that formula can change to 80-20 or even 90-10. And here's what I mean. When you want to promote a subscription campaign or tickets to an exhibit at Chase's Museum, what we're doing is we're putting an ad on our Facebook wall and everyone's seeing it, right? So if I'm, if I'm posting one thing a day on Facebook, and all of those things are offers, then my fans are seeing five offers, and I'm, I'm just annoying them with offers. Yeah. What this allows you to do is upload a post that only a select part of your audience is seeing based upon who you're, who you're selecting, right? So that not everyone on my page is seeing me serving them an offer. Um, it also allows you to upload a list, similar to we talked about with a customer match. You can upload a list to Facebook now, and it could be a list of subscribers, and you could hit them with a renewal offer, right? Or it could be a list of, of people, to Terrence's point, who came to, came to see one specific concert and then serve them an ad for uh, a similar type artist later in the season. Uh, so this is a very specific example. I don't, I don't work on this show, but I got served this ad for The Band's Visit, right? The Band's Visit, it's a beautiful new musical, won, won the Tony Award, won actually 10 Tony Awards, but I thought this ad was really interesting. So they're saying, Band's Visit is one of the most Tony-winning musicals in history, here's their TV commercial, and yet, it's like, best prices is fall. So they clearly have inventory, right? They clearly have a need to still sell tickets despite their success. But what they don't want to do is flood their Facebook, you know, they're telling the story about what a success they are, they don't want to flood their Facebook page with the fact that they actually have tickets. Mm -hmm. So what they've done is they've created a dark, dark post and somehow they've selected me. Probably they've hard targeted people in New York City who are fans of Broadway shows, right? So this is a really smart way to push out an offer that doesn't flood your page with a ton of salesy messages. Um, and again, you can create as many of these as you want without sharing them with everybody. 
And, and the thing that gets me jazzed is there's so many opportunities here for us, not just in the marketing space, but also in developing financial resources. So again, as I said, you can really engage different demographics with different imagery, right? So if we know we have a customer base under 40 and they're gonna respond to a young artist, we can serve that image. If we have um, you know, a family audience, we can serve them that specific imagery, right? Um, the second, as I said, is a siloed offer and discount. So you can provide an offer to one subsect of your audience base on Facebook with this technology. Um, as I said earlier, subscription renewal, right? Upload that list of subscribers and hit them with a renewal notice, right? If I'm a single ticket buyer and I'm following you on Facebook, I don't really want to see that. Um, and, you know, again, with, with development, it, you can um, invite people to an event and hit them with a reminder message that only those people are seeing. And lastly, because these are ads, we can A-B test and see the results. And then that makes us smarter about the things that we're posting organically, right? So when we post about our exhibit, about our new musical, we can use these learnings from the, the, the dark ads to be smarter about what we're sharing on our regular pages. So uh, this doesn't necessarily belong in a marketing presentation, but I, I love that, that Chase talked earlier about, about technology and the arts. And the reason that I'm so jazzed about augmented reality, and it's not a typo, we're not serving bacon, it's beacons, right? We're not making bacon for folks. Um, you know, as costs have come down for augmented reality and beacons, which are sort of wayfinding devices in museums, it becomes a marketing tool, right? And Chase, I think what he said earlier about 18 to 24 year olds, we're not accommodating them in our museums. So how can we use technology and in our marketing efforts to get them in the door, right? So um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. The, the Cleveland Museum has come up with this amazing app, right? And what Art, Arts Lens does is it allows you to come to the museum dock your phone next to this device, upload the app, and create your own way through the museum, right? So with beacon technology and wayfinding, if I'm a first time visitor, I, there's, there's no map to unfold. I can click on the three things I wanna see and be on my way. It also has built in um, augmented reality that allows the user to hold it up to a painting and give them context, right? Demystify the experience, right? So as we're marketing to first time visitors and certainly millennials, we need to communicate to them, we have a tool that's gonna make you comfortable and, and make you your own mini expert throughout, throughout the experience. Um, and again, the costs for these things are coming down vastly. There's free apps, there's free technology, so I encourage all of you in the visual arts to take a peek. And lastly, I wanna talk to everyone about influencers, right? So you see her here, this isn't just for Kim Kardashian to play with, right? With her, with her 114 million followers. Um, influencers are folks who have a lot of followers and Companies and corporations like to give them free products in exchange for them talking about those products. Well, the arts need to play ball in this space, okay? And there's some data behind this. Um, in 2016, you know, marketers made $6.50 over uh, from every dollar they spent against influencers, okay? And according to Adweek, 40% of respondents to a survey said that when they saw a product or service that one of their influencers shared, they bought that product, right? So there's a level of authenticity to these folks. Um, and you know, again, influencers, there's a level of authenticity. And as, as certainly millennials sort of poke holes in traditional advertising, right? This is a way to talk to them in their own language. So uh, I want to just for the room to find, you know, a macro influencer is, is someone like Kim Kardashian, right? It's, it's for the purposes of this conversation, about 100,000 followers. That's a ton. Okay, but in the art space, we're talking with these folks, the people who have about, I would say, 10 to 90,000 followers, right? So if we all follow Terrence, he can leave here an influencer and he will get free <laughs> shoes and free invites, right? It's not, it's not hard to make somebody an influencer. So that can be one of our challenges. But on the next slide, I wanna show you a couple of examples of, of what an influencer campaign looks like in the arts. So over here on the right, we have a, a user. She has about 20,000 followers. And this is a, you know, an influencer campaign that the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, in Amsterdam did. They went through a renovation and they decided that they wanted to target families, right? So we've all heard about the mommy bloggers, right? Well, now we have mommy influencers. So clearly the Van Gogh Museum was very clever and they sent out a little Van Gogh um, you know, plush toy it would probably with you know an invite for tickets and a few dates and this influencer showed up and she posted this lovely photo that said when Vincent meets Vincent she insisted on bringing her new friend back to the museum right and this goes out to her 20,000 followers who are ostensibly probably a lot of parents and just positions the museum as the perfect thing to do for your family right um, in my day job I work with cultural and commercial clients one of the commercial clients I work with is Disney theatrical who just opened the juggernaut musical frozen 
And one of our challenges was, how do we convince folks who don't have families that this is a show for them? <laughs> Specifically, uh, you know, adults under 40 years old. So what we did is we sent out mailers. We identified 20 top influencers. We sent them, we didn't pay them. We sent them two tickets, two uh, champagne glasses and some champagne, and two drink tickets, and three nights to, to choose from to come to see the show, right? They all said yes. Again, we didn't pay them. And they showed up and did things like this. Some influencers bring their own photographers to the event, right? So, so here's uh, Allie, and she says, I'm not gonna lie, I sang let it go, let it go all week, and I'm not ashamed to say it, right? Check, she did exactly what we wanted her to do. She came looking hip, she came looking cool, and added sort of a, a street cred-ish to, to the experience. Um, these folks, again, vertical video, so they shared an Instagram story, and this user said, Evan, who I presume is her date, said, Evan just asked if this is apple juice. It's champagne! Hashtag frozen for adults, right? So all we did was give these users free tickets, a couple drink tickets, and a couple rules. I think we said, you know, please don't say this is for kids. And they told their own story about how it was appropriate. It is the perfect thing to bring a friend to, right? So these are just two quick examples of how you could use, um, you know, inventory, free tickets you have lying around to invite people in and have them tell a story that feels authentic to their followers. And the thing I want to leave you all with is it's not just about folks who have 10,000 or a million followers, right? We're all influencers in our own right. So for all of us who are on the Facebook, the social media websites, you know, the Instagrams, et cetera, um, there's power and influence, right? So the next time you're at Chase's Museum or Grace's Theater Company, um, share and talk about what moved you. You know, we're very busy um, talking about our comments on our president's latest tweet and sharing selfies from our vacations and photos with our families, but there is power and influence in the arts. And the more we can promote our friends and our colleagues' uh, you know, programs and exhibits, the better off they're gonna be. Thank you. Thank you.